Ashley Brock reading Nora Roberts' book, Rising Tides, Chapter 6. Ethan didn't mind putting in long hours on the boat at night, especially when he could work alone. It hadn't taken much persuasion for him to agree to let Seth camp out with the other boys in their backyard. Gave Ethan an evening alone, a rarity now, and time to work without having to tune in to questions and comments. Not that the boy wasn't entertaining, Ethan mused. The fact was, he was firmly attached to Seth. <laughs> Accepting Seth into his life had been natural because Ray had asked him to do it, but the affection, the appreciation, and the loyalty had grown and solidified until it simply was. That didn't mean the kid couldn't wear down his energies. He even kept it to hand work tonight. Even if you felt awake and alert at midnight, the odds were you'd be a bit sluggish. He didn't want to risk losing a finger to the power tools. In any case, it was soothing to work in the quiet, hand sand edges and planes until you felt them go smooth. They would be ready to seal the hull before the week was out, and he could start set on sanding the rub rails. If Cam dived right in on them with the bellow decks, and if Seth didn't bitch too much about working with Putty and Cock and Varnish over the next week or two, they'd do well enough. He checked his watch, saw the time was getting away from him, and beginning to put away his tools. He swept up since Seth wasn't there to wield the broom. By a quarter after one, he was parked outside of the pub. He didn't tend to go inside any more than he tended to let Grace walk the mile and a half home when she clocked out. So he settled back, switched on his dome light, and passed the time reading his dog-eared copy of Canary Road. Canary Road. Inside, it was last call. The only thing that would have made Grace happier would have been if Dave had told her that all she needed to get her car up and running was some chewing gum and a rubber band. Instead, he told her it would cost the equivalent of three years' worth of both, and then she'd be lucky if the old bucket ran another 5,000 miles, something she would have to worry about later. At the moment, she had her hands full dealing with an overly incentive customer who was stopping off in St. Chris on his way down to Savannah and was sure Grace would like to be his form of entertainment for the night. I got me a mo hotel room. He winked at her when she stooped to serve his final drink of the night. And it's got a big bed and 24-hour room servers. We could have us a hell of a party, honey pie. I don't do a lot of partying, but thanks. He grabbed her hand, pulled it just enough to throw her off balance, so she had to grip his shoulder. Her tongue on his lap. Then... Now's your chance. He had dark eyes, and he aimed them leering at her breasts. I got a real fondness for long-legged legged blondes. Always treat them special. He was tiresome, Grace thought, as his breath one he breathed one more beer into her face, but she had handled worse. I appreciate that, but I'm going to finish up my shift and go home. Your place is fine with me, Mr. Bob. You can just call me Bob, baby. She had to get to give her. Mr. I'm not. I'm just not interested. Of course he was, he thought, sending her a smile he knew was dazzling. Paid two grand to get his teeth bonded, hadn't he? <sighs> Hard to get routine always turns me on. Grace decided he wasn't worth even a single disgusted sigh. We're closing at 15. You're going to need to settle your tab. Okay, okay, don't get bitchy. He smiled wildly and pulled out a bunny clip thick with bills. He always salted it with a cup of 20s on the outside to fill it with singles. You figure what I owe, then we'll negotiate your tip. Sometimes, Grace decided it was best to keep your mouth firmly shut. She wanted to come out with vicious enough. She wanted to come out was vicious enough to get her fired, so she walked away and took her keys to the bar. You giving you trouble, Grace. She smiled weakly at Steve. It was just the two of them working now. The other waitress had clocked out at midnight, claiming a migraine since she'd been pale as a ghost. Grace had chewed her out and agreed to cover. He's just another of those gifts to womankind. Nothing to worry about. If he's got, not gone by closing, I'll wait until you're locked in your car and headed home. She united a non-communicable humming noise. She hadn't mentioned her lack of transportation, transportation because she knew Steve would insist on driving her home. He lived 20 minutes away in the opposite direction and had a pregnant wife waiting for him. She cast out tables, cleared them, and noted with relief that her probable customer finally rose to leave. He paid his $18.83 bill, borrowed with cash, leaving 20 on the table. Though he managed to monopolize most of her time and attention for the past three hours, Grace was too tired to be annoyed at the pitiful tip. It didn't take long for the pub to empty. The crowd had been mostly college students out for a couple of beers and conversations. On a weekday night, but her calculations, they turned about ten tables, no more than twice, since her shift had started at seven. Her tips for the evening weren't going to make much of a dent in the new car she would have to buy. It was so quiet, they both jumped like rabbits when the phone rang, even while Grace laughed at the reaction, blood drained out of Stephen. Molly? 
was all he had to say. So he leaped on the phone. He answered it with a, sh with a stutter. Is it time? Grace stepped forward, wondering if she was strong enough to catch him if he nailed over. When he began nodding rapidly, she felt her smile spread over. Why? Okay, you you call the doctor, right? Everything's ready to go? How far? Oh, God. Oh, God. I'm on my way. Don't move. Don't do anything. Don't worry. He dropped the phone off the hook and broke. She's Molly, my wife. Yes, I know who Molly is. We went to school together from kindergarten on. Grace laughed. And because he looked so dear and so terrified, she kept his face in her hands and kissed him. Go, but you drive careful. Babies take their time coming. The way for you. We're having a baby, he said slowly. As if doesn't even me and Molly. I know, and it's just wonderful. You tell her I'm going to come see her in the baby. Of course, if you just stand there like somebody glued your feet to the floor, I guess you'll have to drive yourself to the hospital. God, I have to go. He knocked over a chair on his way down the door. Keys, where are my keys? Your car keys are in your pocket. Bar keys are behind the bar. I'll lock up, Daddy. You stop. That was one huge electric grin. Wow. And he was gone. Grace was still chuckling as she picked up the chair and placed it upside down on the table. She thought of the night when she had gone into labor with Aubrey. Oh, she'd been so afraid, so excited. She had indeed driven herself to the hospital. There'd been no husband there to panic with her. There'd been no one to sit with her, to tell her to breathe, to hold her hand. When well, the pain and aloneness had been at its worst, she weakened and let the nurse call her mother. Of course, her mother came and stayed with her, saw Aubrey into the world. They cried together, laughed together, and had made it all right again. Her father hadn't come, not then, not later. Her mother had made excuses trying to smooth it over, but Grace had understood she was not to be forgiven. Others had come, Julie and her parents, friends and neighbors, Ethan and Professor Quinn. They brought her flowers, pink and white daisies and rosebuds. She had pressed one of each in Aubrey's baby book, made her smile remember. So when the door behind her opened, she turned with a joke, Steve, if you don't get going, she'll... Grace fell off. Experiencing more annoyance than fear when she saw the man step aside. We're closed, she said firmly. I know, honey pie. I figured you'd find a way to hang back and wait for me. I'm not waiting for you. Why the hell hadn't you locked the door behind Steve? I said we're closed. You'll have to leave. You want to play it that way? Fine. He sauteed over, leaned on the bar. He'd been working out regularly for months now, and knew the stance showed off his well toned muscles. Why don't you fix us both a drink, and we'll talk about that tip. Her patient's right up. You already gave me a tip. Now I'll give you one. If you're not out of the door in ten seconds, I'm calling the cops. Instead of spending the night on your big hotel bed, you'll spend it in a cell. I got something else in mind. He grabbed her, shoved her back against the bar, and ground himself against her. See, you had it in mind, too. I saw the way you've been eyeing me. I've been waiting all night for some action. She couldn't get her knee up to ram it against him. Against what he was so proudly pushing against her. She couldn't get her hands free to shove or scratch. Panic. Stop started as a trickle on her throat that spread like a hot flood when he shot a hand under her skirt. She was preparing to bite, scream, and spit when he was suddenly airborne. All she could do was stay pressed against the bar, stare at either. You all right? He said it so quietly that her head bobbed up and down in automatic response, but his eyes weren't quiet. There was rage in them, so primal and primitive that she shot go on out and wait in the truck. I? He? Then she squealed. It would embarrass her to remember her later, but it was the only sound that came out of her tight lip when the man rushed at Ethan like a battering ram, head lowered, fist clenched. She watched staggered as Ethan simply pivoted, jabbed once, twice, and flicked the man off like a fly. Then he bent, grabbed the man by the shirt front, hauled him up on his rubbery legs. You don't want to be here. His voice was still with dangerous sharp edges. Because if I see you here after the next two minutes, I'm going to kill you. Unless you got family or close personal friends, nobody's going to give a damn. He tossed him away with what seemed to grace no more than a twist of the wrist. The man crashed into a table. Then Ethan turns back as if the guy didn't exist. But none of the stony furry fury had faded from his face when he looked at his face. I told you to go wait in the truck. I have to. I need to. She pressed the hand between her breasts and pushed up it as she shoved the words clear. Neither of them looked as if the man scrambled up. Someone else, I have to lock up. Shiny. Shiny can go to hell. Since it did appear that she was going to move, Ethan grabbed her hand, hold her to her. He ought to be horse whipped for letting a lone woman lock up this place at night. Steve, he saw the son of a bitch go flying out of here like a bomb was ticking. Ethan intended to have a nice long talk with Steve as well. Soon he promised himself grimly as he pushed Grace into the truck.
Molly, she called. She's in labor. I told her to go. You would, damn idiot woman. A statement delivered with such bubble and flurry. Stopped the trembling that had just begun. Cut off the babbling of gratitude she'd been about to express. He saved her, was all she'd been able to think. Like a knight in a fairy tale. But the thin romantic mist that had been shimmering over her, so rolling brain evaporated. I'm certainly not an idiot. You sure as hell are. He whipped the truck out of the lot, spitting gravel, knocking Grace back against her seat. His rare but formidable temper was in full swing, and there was no stopping it till it had blown itself out. The man was the idiot, she shot back. I was just doing my job. Doing your job? Damn near got you raped. The son of a bitch had his hand under your skirt. She could still feel it, the way it had groped at her. Nausea bubbled up to her throat and was ruthlessly swallowing down. I'm aware of things that... Things like that don't happen at Shinies. It just did happen at Shinies. It doesn't draw that kind of clientele usually. It wasn't local. He was. He was there. He then swung into the drive, hit the brakes, shut the engine off with a hard flicker. And so were you. Mopping up some bar in the middle of the goddamn night by yourself. And what were you going to do when you were done? Walk almost two damn miles? I could have gotten a ride except... Except you're too stiff-necked to ask for one. You'd rather limp home those mile-high hills than ask a favor. She had sneakers in her bag, but decided it wouldn't help to mention it. Her bag still... Her bag, she remembered, which was back at the unlocked pub. Now she would have to go back first thing in the morning, get her things, and lock up before the boss checked. Well, thank you very much for your opinion of my failings in the lecture. And the damn ride home shoved up the door only to have Ethan grab her arm and drink her Where the hell do you think you're going? I'm going home. I'm going to soak my stiff neck in my idiot brain and go to bed. I haven't finished... I've finished. Shirt free and jumped out. Pat and Ben before the blasted heels, she might have made it, but he was on he was out of the opposite door and blocking her way before she'd taken her shot. I have nothing more to say. Her voice was cold and dismissive. Her chin was good. You can just listen. If you won't quit at the pub, which is just what you should do, you're gonna take some basic precautions. Reliable transportation comes first. Don't you tell me what I have to do. Shut up. She did, but only because she was stunned speechless. She never in all the years she'd known him. Seen Ethan like this. The moonlight, she could see the fury in his eyes. Hadn't dimmed a bit. His face was like stone. Shadows looking over it, making it seem harsh, even dangerous. We'll see that you get a car you can trust. He continued in that same edgy tone. And you won't be closing on your own again. When you finish your shift, I want somebody walking you out to your car and wait until you lock it and drive off. That's just ridiculous, he stepped forward, though he didn't touch her, didn't lift a hand, she backed up a pace, a pace, her heart beginning to pound too fast and too loud in here. What's ridiculous is you thinking you can handle every damn thing by yourself, and I'm tired of it. She sputtered, hating herself, you're tired of it? Yeah, I'm just gonna stop, I can't do much about you working yourself after that, but I can do something about the rest. You don't make agreements at the pub to see you're safe, I will, you're not gonna stop, you're gonna stop asking for trouble. Asking for it, outrage gushed through her su such a bowling wave. She was surprised to stop her head then simply pull. I wasn't asking for anything. That bastard wouldn't take no for an answer, no matter how many times I said it. That's just what I'm talking about. You don't know what you're talking about. Senator Ferris was, I handled him, and I would have kept handling him if, how? There was red around the edges of his vision. He could still see the way she'd been pressed up against the bar. Her eyes wide and frightened. Her face spinning ghost pale. Her eyes huge and sheen like glass. He hadn't come in because he thought of what it could have been. Scraped it all. The center of his brain. His already slipping control shattered. Just how? He damn banded in one quick move, yanking her hard against him. Go ahead. Show me. She twisted, shoved, and her pulse began to raise. Stop it! You think telling him to stop once he's got your sense going? Sense going to make a difference? Lemon's fear once he feels the way he fit, subtle curves and long lines. He knew there was no one to stop him, that he could do anything he wanted. Everything inside her was in a mindless rush. Her heart, her blood, her head. I wouldn't. I would have stopped him. Stop me. He meant it. Part of him wanted desperately for her to stop him, to do or say something that would hold the wildness in check. But his mouth was on hers, rough and needy, swallowing her gas, enticing more, and revealing in her fast, hard trembles. When she moaned, when her lips yielded, parted, answering his, he lost his mind. He dragged her onto the grass, rolled with her, on top of her, thick bolt. Thick bolt he'd kept locked on his desire exploded, open, and what poured out was reckless greed and primal lust. He ravaged her mouth with a single minded hunger of a starving wolf. Swamp 
with need so long buried she arched against him straining center to center core to core her system stuttering with shocked pleasure then roared into full raging lift life pump and heat strangled moans quivering delights this was not the ethan she knew or the one she dreamed would finally touch her there was no gent gentleness no care but she gave herself to him through the sensation of being swept away Tra wrapped long limbs around him to bind him closer let her fingers dive into his hair gripped there shivered with the dark glad of knowing he was stronger he feasted on her mouth her throat while he tugged at the low snug bodice he was desperate for flesh the feel of it the taste of it her flesh her flavor her breasts were small and firm the skin smooth the satin against his wide hard palm her heart jackhammering under it she whimpered stunned at the sensation of that rough hand cupping her kneading her churning an aching tug between her legs where muscles had gone liquid and lax she sighed his name she might have shot him the sound of her voice the itch of her breath the shivers on her skin slapping him back cold and hard he rolled away onto his back and struggled to find his breath his sanity his decency they were in her front yard for god's sakes her baby was sleeping inside the house he nearly very nearly done worse than the man in the pub <laughs> he'd very nearly betrayed trust friendship and vulnerability the beast inside of him was pretty precisely the reason he swore never to touch her now by losing it he broke some vow and ruined everything i'm sorry a pitiful face he thought he didn't have any other words god grace i'm sorry her blood was still flowing hot in that wonderful terrifying need her house to screaming she shifted reached out to touch her Ethan, there's no excuse. He said quickly, sitting up so she wasn't touching. Tempted him. I lost my temper and I stopped thinking straight. <laughs> lost your temper? She stayed where she was, sprawled on the grass. The now seemed too cold. Her face lifted to the moon that now shone too bright. So you were just mad? She said, darling. I was mad. <laughs> But there's no excuse for hurting you. He didn't hurt me. She could still feel his hands on her. The rough and system pressure of press of them. But the sensation then, the sensation now wasn't one of pain. He thought he could handle it now. Looking at her, touching her. She would need it, he imagined. Could not live with himself if she was for him. The last thing I want to do is hurt you. The general was a doting parent. He tidied her clothes. When she didn't cringe, she shook the hand over her. I only wanted what's best for you. She didn't cringe, but she did suddenly sharply slap his hand aside. Don't treat me like a child. A few minutes ago, you were treating me like a woman easy enough. There had been nothing easy about it. He took her, and I was wrong. <laughs> then we were both wrong. She sat up, bristling, brist brushed and bristles out of her clothes. It wasn't one side, Ethan. You know that. I didn't try to make you stop because I didn't want you to stop. That was your idea. He was baffled and abruptly nervous. For God, for God's sakes, Grace, we're rolling around in your front yard. That's not what stopped you. With a quiet sigh, she brought her knees up, wrapped her arms around him. Just her so purely innocent, contrasted sharply with the tiny skirt fish and stockings, made his stomach muscles tied themselves into hot, slippery knots again. You'd have stopped anyway, whatever happened. Maybe because you remembered it was me, but it's harder for me to think that you don't want me now. So you're going to have to tell me. You don't, if you want things to go back to the way they were before. They belong back where they were before. That's not an answer, Ethan. I'm sorry to press you about it, but I think I deserve one. It was hard, brutal for her to ask, the taste of him still lingered on her lips. If you don't think about me that way, this was just temper pushing you to teach me a lesson, then you have to say so straight out. It was temper. Except in the fresh bruise in her heart, she nodded. Well, then, it worked. That doesn't make it right. When I, what I just did makes me too close to the bastard in the bar tonight. I didn't want him to touch me. She drew in a long breath, held it, let it out slowly. But he didn't speak. Didn't speak. Didn't speak, she thought. But moved back. He might not have shifted an inch, but he moved away from her in the way that count moves. I'm grateful for you for being there tonight. She started to rise, but he was on his feet ahead of her, offering a hand. She took it, determined not to embarrass either of them any further. I was afraid, and I don't know if I could have handled it on my own. You're a good friend, Ethan, and I appreciate you wanting to help. He slid his hands into the pockets where they would be soon. I talked to Dave about another car. He's got a line on a couple of decent used ones. Since screaming would accomplish nothing, she had to laugh. You don't waste any time. All right, I'll talk to him about it tomorrow. She glanced toward the house where the front door lay. him. Do you want to come in? I could put some ice on your knuckles. You had to draw like a pillow. They're fine. You need to get to bed. Yeah. Alone, she thought, to toss and turn and wish. I'm going to come by Saturday for a couple hours, just to spruce things up before Cam and Anna get home. That'd be nice. We'd appreciate it.
Well, good night. She turned and walked across the grass toward the house. He waited. He told himself he just wanted to see her safely inside before he left. But he knew it was a lie. <laughs> there was cowardice. He needed to listen before he could finish answering her question. Grace. She closed her eyes briefly. All she wanted now was to get inside, crawl to bed, and indulge in a good long cry. She hadn't let herself have serious jagged ears. She turned back, made her lips curve. Yes? Well, I think about you that way. He saw, even with the distance, where her eyes went, darkened, where her pretty smile slid away, so that she only stared. I don't want to. I tell myself not to. But I think about you that way. Now go on inside. He retorted her gently. Ethan! Go on, it's late. She managed to turn the knob to step inside, shut the door behind her, but she turned quickly to the window, watched him get back in his truck, drive away. It was late, she thought with a shiver that she recognized as hope, but maybe it wasn't too late. End of chapter 7